Okay, alignment was the next thing I wanted just to talk about because it's another thing I do try and take some care over. Don't always get it spot on, but I, I, I do try. And really, I was talking about it a little bit before, um, the gauges obviously set the, uh, the rails where you're going through point work, but all of the final alignment is done, done by eye. And there are two, two sides to the alignment. One is the vertical alignment, so that you've got a flat running surface along a rail and from one rail to another. And the other is the lateral alignment, which is much less critical for keeping the trains on the track, but has a much greater impact on what it looks like. I've shown this bit because this is a real mixed economy point here. Um, there's easy track to set the inward and outward uh, rail roads and hold the track as you're soldering. There's so much going on here that there are no plastic sleepers at all. But there is, if you see, a mixture of chairs. I saved up all of my cast brass chairs for this bit of track here because it is a bit of a bugger, if I can put it like that. Uh, there's a lot going on. It's really tight. Uh, the radii are tight. And beyond it was that slip, come diamond, come crossings and points that's also very tight. And I thought I would treat myself to the cast brass chairs and I save them all up for this. So most of these are cast brass. But when you get up to in here, you've got to, I find I had to cut down the etched brass. The slide chairs are a mix. The etched brass at the tip where there can't be an inner claw. And then when there's room for an inner claw, I've used the cast brass ones. Uh, and in places I've bot bottled out and used some ABS chairs which are stuck down with cyanide. So there are what three four different um, types of chair there and I found they all do vary fractionally in in thickness. If you're mixing it with ABS sleepers and chairs the amount of butanone you put on will have an impact on how thick the chair remains under the rail. The more butanone you put on, the squishier it gets and the, the thinner it gets. I find the bra cast brass chairs, uh, depending on the exact batch of rail you have, can be splayed a little bit when you force the rail through them. And that, of course, will raise the rail up a bit as well, apart from the fact that I think they are slightly thicker. And there's also, I don't know if you can see it on here, I'm being really picky here, but there's also, you see it on this one, look, there's uh, a molding line. They're obviously molded in two halves with the mold meeting along this line here. And you often get a little ridge along there, which goes through the whole width of the chair, including the recess where the rail goes. So that also is going to add slightly to the thickness of it. Uh, the etched chairs are likely to be thinner because the legs that go underneath the rail are so thin that they can twist or actually be squashed a little bit if you push down too hard on it. So all of these factors can affect the vertical, the vertical height. And we've got a fair degree of error. I mean, our flanges are half a mil, the rails are mil. I reckon you've probably got 0 0.15, 0 0.2 mil error, but maybe it has more impact on electrical pickup where you're likely to get uh, the wheel riding above a, a dip in the, in the rail. So th th those are sort of some of the, the issues I, I, I think are there. Um, we did have a bit of a discussion about it, Jerry, some time ago, didn't we, on Rich Brummett's Oddbourne thread on RM Web uh, about that when Rich found that butting up between the easy track and soldered track, uh, he had quite a height difference. Jerry still with us? 
No, he's gone. He may be not, right. Okay. Do you ever use a flat file on the top, Laurie? I do. I use it last. And some of the things I do to try to mitigate against variations in height may be over the top and, un and unnecessary. Uh, but I'd sort of do what I can on first principles as much as anything else. So perhaps the most important thing to do is actually to straighten the rail because uh, even our uh, drawn straight lengths of rail do have variations. Some have a very shallow, smooth bow on them, which I think is probably not a problem because the glue you use to stick it down, if you've got a decent length of it, will, will flatten it out. But I still find that some have quite some sort of wavy vertical variations as well as the, the, the lateral ones. So I do spend time and try and straighten that out as much as I can in the vertical dimension. And that's, it's harder in the vertical dimension because the rail's a lot stiffer in that, of course. Can I, can I just ask one question? Yeah, yeah. I'm back in opera again. Uh, I got locked out before. Um, well, I was just looking for the second tie bar. Is it actually off the screen? Uh, I haven't got the tie bars on there yet, Alan. There's, there's the position for the ah, first, but for the second, the first one is, is yes, it's off here to the right. Yeah. I've, but I've not fitted them yet on this, on this picture. I thought you'd come up with something new. <laughs> <laughs> Afraid not. Uh, the virtual tie bar, that would be a thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, so I try and flatten the rail as best I can, and that's just done between fingers holding one end with a pair of pliers and again by eye. When I've been making the track bed, I've, I've tried hard to keep that smooth and flat as well. I mentioned I use two mil ply, which I sand and particularly try and smooth where pieces are butted up against each other. When I've been sticking the template plan down on that, I, I played around with different sorts of glue. That stick sticks well, but I found that I couldn't get rid of all the globs. It tended to sort of leave little lumps here and there. PVA worked, but set too quickly to let me adjust it properly. And also, uh, you had to be really careful to, to not leave different thicknesses of glue there. And what I've used in the end is wallpaper paste on the basis that in past lives I did my own decorating and scraping wallpaper off walls was one of the worst jobs of all. And it didn't seem to matter whether it was stuck to plaster or door architraves or wood panelling or whatever. Getting the stuff off was a real chore. So I experimented with wallpaper paste. I used the, the strong stuff for vinyl and made it up about three times stronger than that recommended and used that. And whilst it all looked very lumpy when uh, I'd got the plan laid out where I wanted it, when it set, it was absolutely dead flat and the glue had evaporated through down to virtually no thickness at all. And it's been down now for five or six years in the earliest parts and there's no hint of it uh, peeling away from the, the wood yet. So that was an experiment which seems to have worked. Maybe we need to come back in 10 years time to um, cross check, but uh, so far so good. I mentioned that the cast brass chairs sometimes splayed out so that they were concave and, and sort of humped up a bit on the sleeper. So before soldering the, the rail, after I've slid all of the cast brass sleepers on, I would file them so that they were flat uh, to get rid of that error. When I'm soldering, I don't tin anything because I found that, for instance, if I tinned the rail or tinned the, 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 the sleeper, then even with a smear of solder, you have a thickness already induced either below the rail or on the sleeper. And when you're 
soldering the one joint. Okay, you're melting what's tinned there so that the rail is pushing down flat against the sleeper with no gap, but the heat is not getting on to the next one. So whatever thickness of tinning you've got there stays and raises the rail up. And that induces, or for me did anyway, induced a regular waviness to the vertical height of the rail. So now I don't tin at all. I clean well. I clean the bottom of the rail with the scratch brush or a file if it's got some of the goo from the sellotape that binds the batches together when, uh, when you buy it. I scratch brush the sleepers. I scratch brush the uh, chair etches on both sides and then I wipe them with isopropyl alcohol or butanone to degrease them. And then I assemble it all dry. I use rosin flux, which is non-corrosive, and I find wets better than any other flux I've come across. Together with the solder balls, which allow you to accurately measure exactly how much solder you want. And the rosin flux gets sucked into the joint right across without any problem. And then when you add the solder balls, which are carried in on the tip of the iron, then they just flash across the joint as well, following the flux. And I exert a gentle downward pressure just to make sure that there's no gap between the rail and the, and the sleeper. So all, all of those things I do to try to uh, get rid of vertical variation. I'm not entirely successful. And at the, the end of it, then there is always Bob's flat file. That's the flux I use. You can get it in brown or black bottles. RS you can get it from. It's more expensive there. But if you Google rosin flux, you'll find a number of suppliers. Those are the solder balls, 0.6 mil. I haven't got quite that many left now. That's uh, an ordinary medical syringe, but you can get them from RS and Eileen's and everywhere else with a needle, the finest needle that they would sell. And if it's got too big a hole at the end, then just squeeze it in the pliers to control the flow. And that works well for me. When using ABS, then the pin flow and again that I find floods if you don't squeeze the end really tight to control the amount that comes out the end. And then finally I use a flat surface whether it be a ruler there's a couple of rulers under here and I've used very flexible rulers here because this is on a slight curve so it's super elevated so a dead flat surface wouldn't be right there because the angle actually varies as you go around the curve. But a flexible ruler works well. My favorite weight for a flat, unsuper elevated bit of track is a straight edge that I invested in from RS. It wasn't that expensive. It's probably about a quarter of an inch thick, probably about an inch and a half wide and a good 18 inches long and it is very heavy to start with and of course being a straight edge it's milled and it's perfectly flat and the reason for doing that rather than individual weights is that it allows the rail to be flush against the underside of whatever flat you're using and any variation that remains between the sleeper chair any waviness in the, in the rail or the track bed can then be accommodated by differing thicknesses of glue between the sleeper and the base. Because what you're after, of course, is the flattest possible railhead. I've acquired various bits of lead. Solder is very good for weighting. 
I've got a couple of batteries from my mother's old electric wheelchair, which weigh a ton and have a dead flat molded plastic base, which are also very handy. But I, we all have our favorites. Okay, lateral alignment. What can we do to, to improve things here? Well, first and most importantly, I would say is when you're building point work anyway, to have a lead in and lead off of plain easy track that you've glued down uh, as accurately to the template as you possibly can. That will hold the rail vertically uh, and will give you the, the datum points for the accurate geometry for what you're trying to build. And when I'm gluing the, the lengths of easy track down, I always thread the rail on fully first because that helps get the alignment at the opposite ends too. Just bring that in a bit. That's with it in place and this is now glued down. Do the same technique of using heavy flatness to uh, glue it down. This is just with the easy track PVA here at each end. Then before I would start to build, then pull the bits of rail out. These are all unsoldered. These are just stubs of rail here to keep the alignment. The longer the piece of rail you have, whether it overlaps the sleepers or not, the more accurately you can get the easy track aligned to the template. Just some variations on a theme here. Uh, this was the double junction section I did. Uh, so short sections of easy track here because you've got a, a crossover almost immediately. Long sections here because another of my maxims is that you build units of track in the longest sections that you can accommodate. Again, that's another way of getting a nice smooth alignment through a whole complex or even a piece of, of, of open plane track. Here's some plane track in the middle. And again, these three sections of easy track were laid with the rail in situ. And then when it's stuck, pulled out. So the, all the black bits are plain easy track, obviously. And these are the PCB sleepers and the ones that are not yet fixed in are the plain plastic sleeper strip. Mm. One of the biggest problems I have is getting a smooth, large radius curve on plain track. And I've ended up even making my plane track on the workbench as well as the point work. So these are A3 sheets of the templotted curves. This is a three foot radius curve on the inside here. So there's three or four sheets joined together here and they're joined as accurately as I can by eye but they've not been stuck down, they're dry, so they've retained their correct radius of curvature, dead smooth throughout. And then I've threaded up the easy track, thread out the sleepers, got them nice and square, and then one section of rail at a time, our 20 inch sections, I've laid them down on top of that using the easy track PVA, and then continued this on round to get the the different tracks and that way I find because again I'm working on the bench I find I can get it almost spot on there's one or two places where you can just detect a slight change in the radius but doing it this way when I come to lay it onto the templated track bed on the baseboards on the track bed then I'll trim it right to the sleeper edge the paper underneath will still give some lateral stiffness and will hold a smooth radius 
but it gives me a second bite of the cherry because when it hits the easy track glue on the template on the track bed the paper will soften and allow me to do the final adjustment and so far i find for me that's worked best for getting these smooth large radius curves again finally all done by eye another trick which is one that jim watts promotes and i would thoroughly recommend is that when you're joining pieces of, of easy track then trim the ends of the rail back so you'd start off you'd lay it like this you need the rail going just beyond the last sleeper so that you've got it dead flat all the way right to the end it's very easy to end up with a dip right at the end if you're not careful or alternatively a curl up it might only be slight but by the time you've got the next rail abutted to it can be a problem and one way to get around that is once the track is set is to trim the rail back i usually do it three sleepers because that's half a, a an easy track molded base and then when you're laying the next piece of track leave the rails long by that much you can show it up dry trim it exactly to the right length and then you would lay your glue spread your glue over the track bed and then feed the rail ends into the chairs here and then lay the rail from there on progressively out and that's the best way to get the most accurate alignment i think vertically and horizontally to the track you've laid leading on to the piece of track you're laying how would you allow electrical continuity then in that case Laurie? can i show you that in a little while i've got a picture that shows shows how i do that okay this is a little jig i made uh, or double track this is a standard six foot way i would glue down one track fully and let that set and then the adjacent track to make a double track i would use this jig and obviously one rail runs in that groove the other rail runs in that groove I lay it to the template to start with but then run that round and that will pull it all into a nice parallel arrangement dead easy to make just by filing up a i think that's probably about a half mil thick piece of of, of brass shim this is just a selection of the other homemade jigs that, that that i've used in track building and finally of course again it always comes back to doing the alignment by eye now this is just laid out to see how it's going to look uh, on the garage floor but these curves are potentially a problem this is a main line here uh, and this is a branch line but you look at the pictures of it and it is all perfectly smooth there's no kinks at all in it and to try and reproduce that was a bit of a challenge i mean we're around about eight ten foot radius here and well there's a transition curve s bend there so the way i've described there i find works works best for me you do have a second chance because quite by accident i found that once the pva has set whether it's the aliphatic easy track glue or ordinary pva once it's set if you find a little kink in the track if you then flood it with water with a brush or a syringe leave it for about 10 minutes you can ease the track across reweight it resist the temptation to fiddle with it and check on it and go back the next day and it will reset it will restick so you can do some adjustments afterwards and it seems to hold the glue if you do that okay it's worth filling in all the insulation gaps in the sleepers in the pcb sleepers i use milliput and i now use this cyano gel to stick the pcb sleeper to the template on the work slab i find that works better than than pva just a little smear of that down each sleeper as i go and you can build up a nice little rhythm with that
this is what you were asking, Bob. I, I did write up a short article in the mag, oh, it must be two or three years ago now, but that's how I fix my wire droppers. Uh, basically, I shave off the outer claw of a chair, drill down a hole about 0.7, it usually goes obliquely because there's a, a gap in, in the plastic under the rail where the chair has been pushed out. And then using uh, ideally a, a 0.5 square or a 0.7 round bit of brass. If it's round, then I'll squash it, bend the tip over, file it a little bit and push that down. And you can get that to pretty accurately mimic the chair. And... Again, the rosin flux, one solder ball, a touch with the iron, you can see when it's gone. And that's the closest I've come to a hidden electrical joint. All right, good. I was just thinking of the cast brass chairs. I know that they're used at baseboard ends, I presume, more than anywhere. Apart um, from yeah, I'm, where I've gone over a baseboard end, I have just laid the easy track straight over it because most of them are on a curve. And what I have done is to use this technique of slicing off the chair and drilling down and pushing a brass pin in to mimic the chair like that and then soldering it as a bit of a, a reinforcement at the join. I mean, it will all, of course, be ballasted and gummed up with, with PVA, ultimately. Sometimes I'll just flood it with liquid cyano as well, as I'm clear, to avoid the fumes, to give a firmer fixing at the baseboard edges, because the PVA, I find, it's always just very slightly flexible. But so far, so good. I mean, mine, of course, doesn't have to move very much. It's only really being broken down and uh, put back up again to either do the wiring or when it comes to doing the scenery. It's, it's not an exhibition layer as such. So it doesn't have to be quite so robust. It doesn't have to be loaded and unloaded from a lorry. And I, I can be reasonably careful of the rail ends as well. But that's, that's, that's what I do. Another little thing that I've, I've done is super elevation. Some of you may have seen the, the video on YouTube of this uh, 18 months or so ago. This track is, is super elevated and this one isn't. That's raised by about half a mil or so. But you can just see the, the, the difference there. I've done it simply by laying different thickness strips of thin card or paper along the outside track and then filling the the little steps with PVA. That seems to have worked quite well. I'm just going to change share again a second. What surprised me was just how much wobble there was, because when I looked at it, it looked dead smooth. There's a slight degree of super elevation at this curve here but much more on this one which is a much sharper curve just see it start to go there just a bit but more mark there and i've tried to make the degree of super elevation about right for the radius of the curve and the speed that it would go at It'll be more marked when I get to the main lines and particularly the reverse curve there. Can I ask one thing, Laurie? Yeah? When you've gone to this trouble with super elevation and so forth, have you put any transition curves in? Yes, all the curves are transitioned. Yeah. I find that for about half a mil of super elevation, if as long as you've got four four inches or so of transition you're you're okay and i build it up strip by strip a sheet of ordinary copier paper is about 0.1 mil so 
one layer of 0.1 mil and then another inch on another layer, a second layer, another inch on a third layer and so on. Um, I've got some thin card that's 0.2 as well to save um, doubling up on so many layers. I, I'm lucky that I've got prototypical curves pretty well. So the transition curves are often longer than that. So it really is quite shallow. None of the locos I've got are compensated. None of the stock I've got is compensated. But um, yeah. I think it's really worthwhile. I, I said before, I, um, I didn't bother on the, the scenic side of the, the bath layer at home, which is quite a long about a scale half a mile with some uh, long, fairly scale length curves. And I didn't bother, and I really wish I had now. When I see uh, your stuff end on going through that with the super elevation, it, it really does look great. It's yeah. well worth the, the little bit of trouble. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased with it. But of course, on that big reserve, reverse curve, come swinging out from the station and then curving back round, uh, you'll be able to look end on through most of that curve. Yeah. So you will be able to to see it to full advantage. I think it's, yeah, you, you can pick it up. You can, the eye is very, very sensitive, as we've often said. And yeah. you look sideways on a bit of track that's on a curve. You can tell whether it's flat or whether it is canted or not. But you need to be looking at it at least sort of three quarters on, I think, to, to, to pick up the, the, the full effect of it. But that is some that is going to be a feature of what what mine is. So I had a little experiment with it, found that it was actually very simple to do. So so has done it. No, well worthwhile, I think. It yeah. really really does make a difference for looking a lot. Luckily, mine's viewed pretty much from the side. You're not looking end on, so it's not such a great loss. But nevertheless, I I certainly would have done it had I had I seen you know seen it before. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've gone on and on and on again this morning. Um, the, the last bit I was, was, was just going to do was a little bit about inset track, which I find ra rather alluring. Uh, and I've got a chunk of it in the Goods and Coal Yard on the Oval Town here. This is the extent of it. Uh, it's not fully weathered and obviously far, far from finished. Uh, I thought I would just say how, how I've gone about it anyway. I'm lucky in this, in that it doesn't need to be electrified, because this is all tractor territory. Uh, there's no loco that will come beyond the shed here along this track, which is the only entrance into this yard here. So I don't have to worry about keeping the running surface of the track just above the ground surface on either side and between the rails. But as you can see, there's one point in here and three wagon turntables, which, uh, which all have to function. Firstly, a brief word about the track itself, and it will be brief because there isn't much to say about this. The ground within the yard has simply built up around the rails by the accrual of yard filth of decades. So you only see the rail heads, except right at the ends of the siding, where some of the sleepers can just be made out. So the track could be basic in the extreme and because the track and track bed had to be as thin as possible for the track to drive, the rails were soldered directly to strips of 0.4 millimeter thick double-sided PCB, which were laid almost randomly just where they needed to be to give enough strength to keep the rails to gauge. The track assembly was then stuck down to the PCB track bed with a liquid two-pack epoxy. This was how it started. This is one mil balsa and I had some sheets of that and placed it over the track, pressed down on the track to leave an imprint of the rails on the underside of the balsa. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like the reverse of, of, of brass rubbing. And then from that, I could cut along the outside edge of the rails to get these rather irregular shapes here. I could trim the inside to give enough of a flange way. There's about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 on each side here. So just a little bit of leeway. And then glued that 
Uh, I can't remember what glue it was. It was probably PVA or it might have been a liquid two pack, the sort of thing that aero modelers would use to stick the fabric on, on the wings where you mix it up, but it stays quite runny and you can put it on with a brush in contrast to Araldite where it remains very gloopy. And then that was stuck down onto the sleeper ends with a, a, a wadge of it in the middle as well. And that came almost up to the top of the, the rail surfaces and just saved an awful lot of filling in with polyfiller or whatever, uh, and also help reduce the weight. And you see here, I've had to cut it around the check rails and, and the wing rails and so on. That is with the, the whole area done with the balsa. This stub just comes into the, uh, into the gas works. These are mechanisms relating to the wiring chute operation of the three wagon turntables. Uh, good shed sits over this one and the ground is built up pretty much to the edge of the balsa here on the real thing um, and because I don't need it down here I've just chamfered it off to the, uh, the PCB sheet which is the, the track bed here. So that's with it all done. This was done prior to the show at Tutbury and this was the state it was in I think when it went to Tutbury. But it was still left a, an awful lot to be desired because the, the thickness of the walls did actually vary a lot and the rails in some places were quite a bit higher than the, the surface of the balsa so the tractor didn't work over it. Just to come back a bit. What I finished the final coat with was a bit of a mixture. Uh, I started out with a crown textured paint which is a very fine texture they had a sort of a sandstone colour, all colour, make it a bit grey, and also one of the, uh, is it Green Scenes, textured paints, which has a much greater variation in texture and some, what would be quite big stones in two mills. So that gave it a, a, an extra little bit of body as well. Uh, and I mixed that up and, until I, I got the right sort of colour, but it was still far too runny to spread as a, as a ground surface. And then I just progressively added talcum powder to it and mixed it in until I got something about the consistency of tetrion or polyfiller. Uh, and then I got a big wide spreader and I just lathered it over everything except these uh, working bits here, I'd left it around those, but over all the track, I didn't go over the wagon turntables, I went up to it and I was a, a lot more careful around the edge of those because I didn't want to gum those up, but I didn't worry about the track apart from the, the tie bars which I was careful around as well. So that ended up absolutely confluent and I used the big flat spreader to get it down to the same as the running surface of the rails and in places you could just see the running surface of the rails and in other places you couldn't. And then I made a jig to scrape out the flangeways and bring it down to rail height everywhere uh, and this was I think a 0.5 mil thick piece of brass that I just put an angle into. I saw a couple of slots at this edge where the outside of the slot was to gauge probably about 9.35, 9.4 rather than the 9.42. Then cut two of those rounded little pieces and set them in and soldered them in at right angles and they project about three quarters of a mil so not quite down to the, the sleeper depth, not quite the full depth of the rail, but certainly more than the flange depth. And on this side, I've just done one because sometimes I wanted just to be able to get one in where you're around points and things like that. And then I just ran that along all of the track to clear out the flangeways. And this being dead flat would rest on the top of the rail. These 
pieces would go into the flange and clear out the great bulk of the of the gunk where it wasn't needed this would have let you do it around wing rails um, uh, and in between switch rails and so on the other thing i did was to just file down the tip of a jeweler screwdriver that is about 0.5 wide and again it's about three quarters of a mil deep so you could run that along the top of the rail that would go down the inner running face of the rail and do the final scraping out along the rail uh, so that it would be clean as i said i was lucky that i didn't need to uh, maintain electrical contact through the rail so it wouldn't really matter if the wheels just fractionally lifted off the rail surface. I think if I was having to power a loco across it, then I would need to do something to just fractionally reduce the ground level immediately outside the rail to be sure that the rail height remained above the inset, uh, the inset gunk. It's still got to be painted and weathered. Um, you can see here the variation in texture here. This is a, a coarse area that's uh, largely uh, reflects the, the evergreen textured paints. And I think this, this was either coal yard muck or general yard muck. Um, there are little divots in the edge of the, the fill here, which I'm not really, really worried about because it would have been quite irregular uh, anyway. It certainly was never cobbled or anything like that. This is just dust, the coal, the coat, the mess of a hundred years that's built up here. You do need to be a little bit careful around the switch blades to make sure you've got room for them to open and of course just miss the tie bar. For the tie bar what I did here was to get a piece of paper, ordinary copier paper, and glue it up in this area and let a flap of it extend almost up to the tie bar and then I allowed the gunk to sit on top of that but I put a sliver of paper between the tie bar and the sheet underneath so that it didn't actually stick to it. The tie bar here is a, a broader flatter piece of tough knoll that is probably extends something like that so I had to sort of cantilever the, the fill over the top of that so that it was just the tie bar that uh, that was left um, for the particular purpose here of course the tractor had to be able to run over it without getting stuck in the in the groove so it did have to be fairly flat just a couple more pictures of it around the wagon turntables uh, this is where i was finally sanding it down to get it flat and i've actually gone through the textured paint there the balsa was a bit to proud here but that will just all in the end get touched up with a bit of airbrushing and weathering and and, and what have you but uh, there we are that's how I've done that inset track I've got the edges to finish off here this is cattle docks along here so that's going to run into a, a concreted area with a drain in. I've been lucky that the inset track here has comprised ordinary plain track which has just become submerged under the filth of ages, which I can represent by simply spreading sludge all over the place and levelling that off. It would have needed a much more refined construction technique if, for instance, the tracks had been proper tram tracks or had the yard been cobbled or tarmac. I'm sorry that I don't have anything to offer to help modelling that type of surface. Finally, as it's the end of the track session, that's the, 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 the throat of the Oval Town. And that's the other end with the big radius curves I was talking about, as far as it's got. So there we go. I hope the four of us talking about the different ways we've done it is helpful. Um, there's no prescription here. Everybody finds their own way of doing it. And there are many, many ways to, to swing this particular cat. But maybe there's some ideas in here that others may be able to to take uh, and use uh, and of course the uh, bible for all of this still remains the two mil track book here uh, which has enough prototype information in it to both understand template and build your own track pretty accurately 
and a wealth of information about jigs, tools and techniques 